Hi there, friends. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. John. I'm an instructional designer, and I'm here to talk about everything instructional design, um, teaching and learning, anything related to that. And today's video is going to be a little different. <laughs> Full disclaimer. Um, Everything I'm about to say is just based on my personal experience. Uh, but there are so many of you who are out there wondering, I want to get into instructional design. There are a lot of creators out there who talk about the field of instructional design or what it's like for them. And as somebody who went through six years of doctoral education and in instructional design, I can tell you my program did not prepare me for the realities that is working as an instructional designer. Uh, in the field of instructional design, you've got corporate America, you've got government work, and then you have higher education or education in general. And the worlds between higher education and corporate America and government work, very, very different, very different. So for all of those who are wanting to become an instructional designer, I have some of my least favorite things about being an instructional designer. That's what we're going to talk about today. These are uh, based on my experiences. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and let's go ahead and get started. Um, so things, <laughs> hate is a very strong word, but um, we're going to use that just because sometimes at the end of the day, you just want to be like, why did I get into this field? Um, why do I have to deal with the things that I have to deal with? And if you find yourself working as an instructional designer and some of the things that I'm going to list resonate with you, let me know because you go out into social media and you hear all these people talk about these wonderful, fabulous things, but nobody talks about the things that are not so wonderful and fabulous. So that's what this video is all about. So things that I hate about being an instructional designer in higher education. Disclaimer, this is based on my experience. This is based on um, my experience working where I currently work, uh, my work working with other educators around the country. If you are new to my channel, my name is Dr. John Pauls. I'm an instructional designer in higher education, but I'm also a learning consultant. And so I speak to thousands of educators around the world every single year. Um, I have spoken to over 10,000 educators since the pandemic has started. I came from the K through 12 space. So I was a teacher before I transitioned into instructional design. And um, so this is all coming from that vantage point. I work at a very small private university um, and it's wonderful because we've got you know low student to faculty ratio, uh, but it can also be a little tricky kind of navigating that. And so this video is based on my own personal experience. If you don't agree, that is completely fine. If you've got a different experience, leave them in the comments below. Make sure to like and subscribe before we get in. But I think it's important if you're wanting to get in the field, especially being an instructional designer in higher education, you should know some of these things and be prepared because I was not, <laughs> I was not. Okay, so first thing is first, and I think this is pervasive in education, corporate America, government work. Not a lot of people understand what an instructional designer is. What does that entail? What do we do? What is our background? What qualifies us to be able to discuss the art and science of designing effective learning? Uh, a lot of people don't know what it is. When I say I'm an instructional designer, it goes over a lot of people's heads and I know that they don't understand fully until I get a chance to work with them and until I get a chance to impart my own knowledge and wisdom on them relating to instructional design. So it's going to vary depending on where you're working. It could be varying between different higher education institutions, but the art and the job duties of an instructional designer are very diverse. <laughs> and you will find, no matter where you work, you may have some skill creep where uh, your bosses or people that you work with expect you to do more than what an instructional designer would do. And so at the heart of instructional design, an instructional designer should be knowledgeable about the science of learning, the science of obtaining knowledge and presenting content in a meaningful way. They should understand uh, the differences between synchronous and asynchronous learning, online, blended learning, flipped learning, hybrid learning, whatever you want to call it. They should have a strong, strong conceptual foundation into the art and science that is teaching. With that knowledge, they can then go and prescribe solutions and instructional strategies based on the instructional problem that they encounter. Uh, in my field, where I'm currently working, a lot of people don't understand 
What does an instructional designer do? Why does an ID need to tell me um, how to teach this class? I've been teaching it for 10 years. Why do I need to change my materials? They don't necessarily understand that materials should change. We should be evaluating our content to make sure it's still meeting our learning goals and objectives um, years on. Uh, my rule of thumb is three years. If you've not evaluated your course or your content for relevance, for accuracy, for um, adequate engagement strategies for today's learner in the last three years, you need to revisit that. Um, I did have a professor come up to me just last week and they're like, well, I haven't redone my PowerPoints in 10 years. And I said, a lot has changed in 10 years. They said, no, you know, the science of chemistry hasn't changed in 10 years. Well, chemistry may not have changed in 10 years, but your learners have. And so if you've not taken that into account, um, are we really meeting the needs of our learners? I, I don't think we are. So a lot of people don't understand what an ID is. So if you get into a position as an instructional designer, you need to be prepared to explain yourself. Have your little sales pitch of what you are. Um, you know, don't go by a definition, but go by your actual experience. What are you going to help this subject matter expert or this professor do in their courses? What are you going to do for them? Now, I have been working in my current position for several years now, and when I first started, nobody cared about John. Nobody cared. Um, didn't really, <laughs> didn't use my services too much. And it was really hard because when I had started, I had not yet obtained my doctorate. And working in higher education, if you're not a doctor, people definitely look at you like you don't exist. And so once I did finally graduate and obtain that degree, uh, I started, I had this renewed sense of, okay, I do have my own spot at this table. I do belong here. And since then, I've been showing up 100% authentically as me and kind of un unapologetically so. I have a lot of experience. If you go to www.drjohnpauls.com, you will be able to see every single list of my professional development facilitations. You'll see examples of the things that I've designed. You will see what qualifies me to sit at this table with everybody else. But my peers, they didn't know these things. And so I kind of had to be a little bit in their face with them, um, you know, and and really kind of put out there, I do know this. This is why I'm saying this, because I've I've done the work. This is this is what I have researched. This is my experience. My suggestion is based on this theory. Um, I am approaching it, this instructional dilemma from this lens because of X, Y, and Z. If I can qualify or quantify my work in my approaches to their instructional problems, they are more likely to latch on to what I'm saying. Now, I'm not going to like I I understand theories and I think that they are the foundation of where we have been and evolved into as instructional designers. You have to know the theories, you have to know how people learn, but you also have to be innovative enough to know that in 2023, the theories that we were using in the 1900s uh, may not be completely applicable just now. So you still have to use your brain and your best practice, and you need to continually research to see what else is coming out in the field. I always laugh when people are quoting theories from the 1900s. I'm like, you, did, the, did that theorist understand the impact of technology? Did that theorist understand the role of artificial intelligence? Did that theorist account for a mass disabling event like a global pandemic and remote learning? They couldn't even have fathomed these activities when some of these theories were being created. So I can sit with those theories and I embed them into my practices, but I also use my common sense and experience as an educator in the K through 12 space and in higher education to also guide what I'm doing. So Number one, I get really tired of people not understanding who we are, but that's part of the game. We have to be our own advocates. Number two, lack of timely collaboration. Now, my bachelor's is in organizational leadership and I have my MBA before I pivoted to education for my educational specialist and doctorate degree. And so I'm a very meticulously organized person. I want things laid out a certain way. I want things organized. I am very concise. I like to think that I'm very explicit in my communication. And I don't get that from a lot of other people. And so I am always waiting on other people to do my work. If I set a deadline, the deadline will not be met most times. I am currently uh, designing a series of courses for the Virgin Islands, and I am waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the subject matter experts to get their content to me so that I can start collaborating, asking questions, designing. And it can make it really hard. It means that I have to be really on top of what I'm doing to make sure that I can get the final product to the client 
at the end of the day because i don't know about you but i i will do whatever i have to to make sure that the client is that those timelines have been met with the client and oftentimes that means i'm pulling in some rapid development towards the end because i'm waiting on subject matter experts so my my recommendation to you to avoid this pitfall is before you start working with a SME on a project before you start working with a professor on a project do your very best to have have a plan of attack, have an outline. By this date, we're going to have um, these materials. By this date, we're gonna have these materials. You need to review this by this date. Will they follow those dates? No, they will not, but they'll be closer to that date than if you did not provide that to them um, in advance. And so the lack of timely collaboration is really difficult to uh, deal with in higher education. A lot of times I'll just be sitting there literally waiting for people. I can't do any of my work until they collaborate, respond to an email. Um, me personally, I've got teams and my email on my phone and I'll respond within 24 hours. Usually it's within an hour because I want to get this stuff and I know they're going to take much longer. The return emails usually take about a week. <laughs> and so it is very difficult for me to do my job effectively because I can't get the SMEs to collaborate in time. And I know they probably, thinking on the, the side of the SMEs, they're probably thinking, oh, what does he need to do? Like, he's just taking what I'm doing and he's making things with it. They don't understand how much goes into building an interactive in Articulate or iSpring. They don't understand what goes into analyzing or performing a task analysis on a problem so that we can get to the solution. Um, they're just not knowledgeable about what goes into being an ID. And so that lack of timely collaboration, that's definitely a pitfall. Number three, preconceived notions of what effective instruction is. Um, this is probably a shocker for all of you, but in higher education, you can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Um, but if you are going to work in higher education, chances are you have a terminal degree, a PhD, I've got an EdD, um, there's CIDs, you're gonna have some sort of doctorate or terminal degree in your field to be teaching at the university level. Now, unless you've gotten that EdD, that's that doctorate of education, if you've got a doctorate of philosophy, I don't know that you actually take any classes in effective teaching or learning theories. And if you have, let me know in the comments below, but I've researched a lot of uh, higher education programs of what's required of what the curriculum looks like for different fields. And um, you know, if you're getting your PhD in philosophy, are you really learning teaching strategies, even though your end goal is probably to work in academia where you're going to have to teach classes in addition to your research. And so that's a major problem. And so I'll have professors come in and I call it the park and bark where you make a presentation and you just sit at the front of the, the lecture hall and you talk for an hour. And man, oh man, my brain doesn't work that way. I do not digest content that way. I don't wanna present that way. Um, presenting like this right here with you all is a little different because we're not synchronous. I don't, I'm not giving you an activity to complete with this except for uh, talking and collaborating in the comments. But if I'm in the classroom, I can go up to the classroom and just talk for an hour with a PowerPoint with little to no images. How effective do we think that's going to be? In my classes, the ones that I teach, um, I embed Microsoft Forms links so I can collect formative uh, data. I include different activities where they'll have to raise their hand and discuss things. I might have uh, a breakout room where they can go and discuss in smaller groups about a specific topic. Maybe I'll use a tool like Nearpod or CuriePod to be able to have real live gamification embedded into my courses. We have got to keep our students' attention because I don't know any of us as instructional designers. I don't know professors who will do this. Nobody is sitting and listening to somebody talk for an hour if it is not engaging and doesn't have some sort of interaction. And we lose that. So there are preconceived notions about what effective instruction is. And a lot of the times that is based on the subject matter expert's own personal experience. I learned this way in college, so they should be able to teach this way to these students. You're not in college, the world has changed. Students are working. They have probably limited access to funds. They're stressed out about our social economic status in the United States, if you're working in the United States. And um, it's not the same world. And I always talk about my own personal experience. It took me very a very long time to finish my undergrad. I started off as a music education major for four years. I had to drop out. Then I went and attempted a nursing degree, had to drop out. 
Then I went to business because that was the first online education program, one of the first that was available that was not for a for-profit university. And so I did that and I went on to get my master's because the bachelor's online actually worked for me. And the reason it did not work for the traditional face-to-face -face learning and the traditional teaching methods, traditional in higher education, is because I was working overnights to support myself. I was having to go to work and I was having to struggle to buy food. And so many professors don't think about our students in that way. And so for me, when I teach, I want as much uh, dig as much digital products as I can because I know that students can access that anywhere. I try to make uh, due dates a little bit more open-ended so you can get to the content when you have time. I understand our students have a lot on their plate. And so we have got to pivot what our expectations are for our students to account for the world that they're living in today. And so there's a lot of preconceived notions about, again, what effective instruction is with subject matter experts. And so it takes a meaningful conversation that I have to have with them in order to explain, this is where I'm coming from. This is, these are the things I'm considering. And if we do it this way, you're going to cast a wider net and hopefully impact more students. Um, so the park and bark, so get away from the park and bark. If you need ideas about how to engage your learners in higher education, put them in the comments below and I'd be happy to speak on those. But that's another issue that I have with that. Preconceived notions. Number four, rigidity from subject matter experts or professors. Uh, a lot of times I will have a professor come in and they'll give me a PDF and they'll say, I want you to digitize this. Okay. What are we digitizing? Why are we digitizing the same materials? Are those materials still effective anymore? Um, and so I'll give you an example. Uh, um, I was working with a professor on some case studies. They already had their case study verbiage, four case studies that they were using. And it was just on a PDF. It was just written word. And I was like, we have got to be able to do more. We've got to make it come alive. And so I used those case studies and I strategically ran it through mid-journey artificial intelligence. And so these four case studies, I created in an articulate rise page. The first case study I actually made into a video where they could actually watch using artificial intelligence, uh, the same character go through this case study. So it was like they were watching the case study in addition to hearing it. I was trying to capture more input into their brain. Brains. And so uh, we're going to see how effective that is. And the other case studies, because I didn't have time to make videos, I did the incorporating images. So I uh, went to chat, actually went to mid journey and I ran in the scenario. If I was reading a paragraph about a young woman who was dealing with anxiety and it was talking about, you know, her sitting on her couch at home anxious, I would go to mid journey and say, generate me an image of a white female, 13 years old, sitting on a couch wrapped in a blanket, looking depressed and anxious. And I could take that picture that it generated, put it in the case study to accompany it. What a lot of people don't understand is, um, you know, a lot of people are like, stay away from images. We have to make things accessible. And I, I just don't agree with that. There, there's duality when it comes to accessibility. So I have a PDF. I have something that a screen reader can read where the same message is going to be given to individuals who may uh, need that reinforcement. But then I also think about our neurodivergent learners. Um, as a teacher in the K through 12 space, I taught a self-contained classroom for students who are on the spectrum. And um, if you look at the research when it comes to teaching students on the spectrum, the visuals are incredibly important and visuals are important to me uh, if i don't have something to look at when i'm hearing the message it just doesn't resonate as much with me and so just by incorporating images or a video with those case studies i kind of expanded the reach and the impact uh, or potential reach and impact for the learners and so I could have done more with this, but the professor was very set in their ways about this case study, the, this is what I want. And so I find a way to take the professor's rigidity and find a way to enhance it. It may not be exactly what we could have done, but it's better than what it was. And so you will find when you work with professors or subject matter experts, they're often very, very uh, confident about what they want and sometimes it doesn't align with your vision and so you have to find a way to advocate for your vision hit the things that you have to hit and really come to a common ground and it can be difficult for people to do that collaboration is not an easy thing for a lot of people so rigidity that's another thing um lack of digital skills number five 
That's a big one. That's a big one. When we're designing instruction, uh, a lot of times I'm a big advocate for using a learning management system. Even if we're meeting face to face, I can have my assignments in the learning management system. I can have collaboration. Everything can be in one place. And that goes back to the learners who need to be able to learn on the go. Maybe they need to revisit your lecture. Uh, every week, even though I teach a face-to-face -face class, my slide deck is embedded in my learning management system so students can click through at any time. All activities, assignments, and assessments are done in the learning management system so they can access it anywhere. And I can do easy streamlined grading. Um, my announcements, they're in the learning management system so that I can prompt my students and make sure that they understand the expectations for that week. And so uh, I think everybody should be using their learning management system, even if you are face to face. I think that we need to teach our students to collaborate and communicate effectively in digital spaces. Most of them will have to do that when they get out to career or workforce. Um, and so, and it's, it cuts down on resources. If we're not having to print out papers, you're not having to wonder, where's this file? It's in my learning management system. You missed a class, go to the learning management system and get the lecture, get the notes. Um, if we record ourselves while we're lecturing, we can put that in the learning management system. We can make learning accessible to anybody at any time. It just takes a little bit of effort and sometimes we don't wanna do that. And so for me, it is very hard as somebody who can use virtual reality to enhance your learning opportunities. I can build interactive games. We can make amazing slide decks that can accompany your um, lectures. We can do videos. I could make cartoon videos for you. There are so many things that I could do as an instructional designer to enhance your current practices. But if I'm working with a professor for their class and the professor can't even share a file with me, they don't know where it went or they don't know how to share a file, they don't um necessarily understand even converting a pdf and that's not all of them it's just some um if they don't have the necessary digital skills that we expect of our students it can make collaborating and working together very very difficult now as an instructional designer you can go in and meet face to face go to the coffee shop and meet with them draw it on paper do whatever you need to but it definitely is a barrier that does impact the work of an instructional designer if the subject matter experts that you're working with are not able to collaborate in a digital space the way that you need it to. So I'm kind of always having to switch my approaches based on who I'm working with. If I know that I'm working with somebody who is not tech savvy, I have to really adapt what I'm doing in order to get the, the, the process completed. So that can be a little bit of a pain. Being seen as support staff versus expert collaborators. This is a big one. Uh, it goes back to our people not understanding what instructional designers do or who we are. But there are so many times where people I get, and I don't know if it's intentionally, probably not, but I get excluded from conversations. Even though I am a professor and I teach classes, but I'm not a full on professor because my full job is instructional designer. And so people will look at you as if you don't know what you're talking about or you won't be included in the conversations that are occurring campus wide because you're not faculty, um, you're staff. And so a lot of people equate you to being a computer technician or a help desk. I can't tell you how many help desk requests I get in my email, even though that's not what I do. I still have to help them. Um, and so it can be very difficult. A lot of scope creep comes up. Um, and scope creep is when you're a job as an instructional designer, but people, because they don't understand what an ID is, they ask you to do more and more. So for instance, I'm an instructional designer. I am a graphic designer. I am a video designer. I am a professional development facilitator. I am a professor. I am a proofreader. I am a project manager. Um, Everything that involves the act, I, I joke that I'm a full stack instructional designer because I literally do everything in my job and, and people don't understand just how much that takes. And that's not everywhere. Some places that you work in higher education, there'll be a certain team that does proofreading. There'll be a certain team that just deals with video, certain team that just deals with assessment. I work on a team of three. <laughs> and so it's it's we're doing it all. And so um, it can be really kind of frustrating at times when people don't understand what goes into what you're doing, how much work you put into what you're doing, and they see you as this staff member instead of an expert collaborator who is there to help ensure that your students reach the desired learning objectives and that they have an amazing learning experience. So what do we do? What?
do we do? I don't know about you, but for me, I am still figuring this out. Um, every year, I feel like I get better and better at this, but it's basically come down to my own self-advocacy. And I historically, I'm not one to be sort of braggadocious. I am more of a quiet person, but over time, I've realized that has been a disservice to me. And so I um, politely and I don't know, I, I try not to have a big head about it, but I definitely assert myself in situations where it's warranted. Um, so for instance, I, Dr. John Pauls, that's what's in my email signature. I make sure to put it out there because I don't get the same level of respect. Um, I'm starting to get more because of the doctor name in front of me than I did before. People used to look at me like I was just, you know, what do you know? Well, now they're kind of inviting me more to the table because they say, oh, you do know you're at the same level as everybody else. Um, I also talk about my achievements. Again, if you were to go to my website and you were to look at everything that I have accomplished so far in my career, you'd probably be like, whoa. And I don't talk about that a lot because I don't do it for the bragging. I do it because I care and I love what I do. But at the same time, um, you know, for a professor who secured $10,000 in grant funding, who's celebrating his victory, who is uh, talking, this is a career win, yada, 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 and everybody's respecting them. I insert that I got 3.5 million, 3.5 million. So I can speak that language as well. Um, the professors who are talking about speaking at a conference, yes, I've, I've done that too. Go look at this. So I kind of match their energy when we talk about these things because I need them to understand that you are talking to a peer. It's not it's not somebody who is not knowledgeable. We can we can work together and you can view me as an expert in my field. I will view you as an expert in your field. We will come together and make amazing learning happen. Um, and so I've had to be a very strong advocate for myself. Um, I'm not very shy about things and I'm more assertive with my recommendations. And when I give my recommendations or I give my approaches, I'm always backing it up with research, with science. I'm telling them why I'm saying what I'm saying. And if I can get them to understand that, then it makes it a little bit easier for me. Um, but other than that, what do we do? We have to keep advocating for ourselves. We have to talk more about what we do as instructional designers. Um, and we have to kind of have a thick skin have to set some boundaries and uh, we have to know our worth. And so this is some of the things that bug me. Overall though, I will say I love what I do. I love what I do every single day. Being able to really be creative, innovative, scientific, to solve instructional problems and dilemmas, I love it. It's It fills me up. And so I don't let anybody get to me. I just find a way to meet them in the middle, to get them to see my point of view. And then we see what we, kind of magic we can create together. And so uh, my advice to you all, if you're trying to get into uh, instructional design, especially in higher education, you have to have a thick skin. You have to be organized. You have to be willing to collaborate, but you also have to know your worth. And you have to develop a way to explain and collaborate without, um, you know, going a little cuckoo because it will get you there. <laughs> it will get you there. Uh, this was a lot longer than I want it to be, but it's been very therapeutic for me being able to just get this out there into the YouTube verse. Um, if you found any of these helpful, uh, let me know in the comments below. Make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, if you have different experiences or different approaches of dealing with some of the negatives of being an instructional designer, let me know. And don't let this scare you off. Every job has negatives. Everywhere you go, anywhere you work, you're going to have a downside. That's why it's called work. But the hope is that we can minimize those downsides of our jobs and really focus on the joy and the creativity. And so if you're wanting to get instructional design, it's a fantastic field to do that. If you need help, let me know in the comments below. Uh, and make sure to check out the rest of the videos on my YouTube page because there's a whole lot of fun stuff that you can explore and create with. So... Uh, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully it wasn't too negative for you, uh, but sometimes we just have to vent. This is Dr. John. Until next time, I'm going to get back to work. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you all later. Bye.